April 23rd, 2015 with Mr. Rex Edward Keller. Um, so first, can you please say your name and spell it? Rex Edward Keller, R-E-X, E D W A R D Keller K E L L E R. I was born in Saxton, Missouri, October the tenth, nineteen twenty-three. And you grew up in Missouri? Yes, yes, in Dexter, Missouri. What kind of a education did you have? I had the high school course there. And I went a year and a half to the University of Missouri and left because I was proposed to be inducted into the military. They gave me test. So then I got a job at Los Alamos. My brother had got there a job in the chemistry department, Kennedy's chemistry division. Was your brother a, a chemist? Yes, he was in chemistry, but he changed later to physics after the war. Um, so this, how did you, um, what kind of a test did you take to, for, to get into the special engineer detachment? To Los Alamos? Yes, what well, kind of a test? I didn't take any tests except the FBI came to town to see if I was a security risk. That was all the test there was to it. I just went in to do various work in the chemistry department, but then I transferred over to Seth Nedemar's physics department. To backtrack a little bit, what were you studying at the University of Missouri? Just the general, I might have what, Bachelor of Arts degree that, at that time. I was at, wasn't in physics or chemistry. So do you think your background in physics or chemistry made you a good candidate for the Manhattan Project? I don't think so. I think at that time they were just looking for more people. Uh, Ralph Nobles and my brother were going to a teacher's college at Cape Girardeau, Missouri, and they were calling around to get people interested in physics. And Ralph was recommended there at the physics school in Cape, and he went to work with Fermi at Chicago in 1942. They opened Los Alamos, and Ralph went there with some of the others from Chicago to Los Alamos early in 1943. My brother then, Ralph, cured him a job in the chemistry department in the spring of 43. And then my brother got a job for me and I went, after the FBI came to town and I went there in, July of 1943. How did your brother and Ralph Nobles know each other? We grew up together in the same town. All of these people grew up in Dexter, more or less. We knew each other, you see. Did, do you think that the teachers in Dexter encouraged their students to go into science? It's unusual to have so many people from one town who worked on the Manhattan Project. No, I don't think so particularly. Keaton and Ralph were just that way. And the other fellow that came from Dexter was uh, Andrew Atkins, and he was a very good student. And he wasn't in the military, maybe 4F. And of course, Robert Nobles went up, that was Ralph's brother, older brother, and he went to Chicago and worked in 42. But he stayed in Chicago. He didn't go to Los Alamos. There's Robert Nobles. And later on, Bill Nobles was younger, and then Ralph got him a job. And then after that, Ralph got his father a job. So that made four Nobles, two Kellers, and one Andrew Atkins total up to seven. That's great. There. Um. So were you, did, were you expecting to be drafted into the military during World War II? 
Yes, I had applied when I was at school and a friend, uh, Jim Sisler, uh, but I couldn't pass the physical to go in the Air Force. But they sent me into a um, hospital for a physical, so I determined there was no use of going the third semester, and I just waited to be drafted, and my brother got me a job then at Los Alamos when I was waiting to be drafted. The draft situation was fairly erratic. I don't know why, of course. Um, what did your brother tell you about the job at Los Alamos? As I remember, it, he said, well, they're doing something there about warfare that will be greater than the machine gun. And so that impressed you? Somewhat, yes. Um, how did you, did you get any training when you were drafted into the Special Engineer Detachment? Into the SEDs, no. No, I just did the, the direct kind of labor. There was no, for me, no. I think some did go, I think my brother went into a little program at Los Alamos in some kind of, physics or training. They just did that on off hours, of course. Did you have to do any army training for the SCD or was it straight to Los Alamos and into the science? Well, they just wanted more people to work and uh, they started the SEDs after I, I was a civilian, you see, and then I got into the military and um, they established this SADs and brought in more people that was in the military. Now they were all uh, enlisted down there. They brought in one fellow who was a lawyer and then they made him, De Sabatino I think was his name, they made him a lieutenant and I think that was because he had to sign papers, official papers and stuff. He was in physics, but they put him in the tech area. See, the tech area was what we called the, uh, the main area. The engineering department run the fire department and the PX and a lot of the housing and the roads and all that. They had private contractors in there, and then the MPs um, did the policing, you see. Then they moved up on the hill there behind to do a lot of the experimental work and explosives and they went down in the valleys that they brought more people in the project. How did you first arrive at Los Alamos and when did you get there? Well, I got there I, in 43, of course, but you know, there was a shortage of gasoline in the eastern part of the United States because of the German submarines, and they were building a pipeline uh, to carry gas back east. But the cars were cheaper, so I went over there in June and bought a new Chevrolet uh, car for $1,050. It had a few miles on it, and I drove that to Los Alamos. What was your first impression of Los Alamos? Well, back then, they, they didn't have the good road up there. They had switchbacks, you see. And um, that was the old style up to that school. They had a little office in Santa Fe. And I checked in there, and they had a fellow that wanted to go up, so I let him ride in my car up there. And uh, they had a big old building that was out of lumber, of course, and I got a bed on the second floor upstairs with some others that just come in. They didn't have enough housing at that time. Then I got a room in one of the buildings that they built over. Ralph and my brother was over there close in another building. And a little interesting thing happened uh, at the other building soon. They had a little Saturday night party, just a little dancing. And Fermi came and uh, of course there wasn't many people there. And Oppenheimer and General Groves came. 
So we had hunting guns, rifles, and so forth. And Ralph was showing Fermi his hunting rifle. And then Groves saw that, and Groves wanted to put an end to the civilians having guns on a military post. An opera timer talking him in to letting us keep our gun, hunting guns. But that was quite interesting, I thought, that, that Oppenheimer went to kind of the bat for us. What was, did you have any other interactions with Oppenheimer, or what was he like? Oh, I never talked to him. Uh, he was friendly and uh, talked around there, and there was maybe 30, 40 people there then in that little room. He was quite congenial for us, I could tell, and friendly and so forth, and for me. And, and at that time, Groves was too. Groves was fairly, wanted to be fairly strict, but for us, I could tell, really Groves' main thing was getting properties together, security, and uh, encur trying to get somebody or encourage people to come. But you had to have a lot of supplies, of course, and Groves, that was one of his view of getting equipment and supplies in there and construction people. They um, had all kind of construction people that had to go in the tech area. Now, Red the Foley was the head plumber. And uh, later on, they discharged Red the Foley because he had a union background. And there was another fellow that came, and he had a bad ankle, named Joe Rahm, I think, out of St. Louis. And you know about opening and shutting the mail, how they did that? The, the censoring of the mail? Oh, yes. When you'd get mail in, they would open it and read it and then seal it back and put it into your box. And when you sent it out, you didn't seal it, and they would read it and send it out. So I think Joe Rahm had some mail that they didn't like, and though they fired him. Well, I think just the normal, you might say, security, if you're reliable and ever been in trouble, and I guess that's the way the FBI did it, but a neighbor, M.T. Mitten, told me that he gave me a good report to them. I think they asked the principal at school, uh, T.S. Hill and maybe someone else. Did your parents know where you and your brother were during the war? Could you tell them where you had gone? Well, yes, my mother knew where it had gone because she rode out in the car with me. She'd never been west, and she got a hotel there in Santa Fe, but that's as far as she knew or anything. And then she went back home, I guess, on a bus. But that nobody went there or anything, is, I've read that in the books, but that's not true. Uh, Dick Feynman rode with us down one time in Albuquerque. We drove down in my car, we drove down to Albuquerque and Feynman went along. So Ralph and Keaton and I and Feynman. So um, I heard his wife, I think, was in a, a sick down there. You've heard that maybe or something. I think she had tuberculosis. And yeah, so he went down with us. What was Feynman like? Always oh, very congenial, but you see, in the military, the top man, the top goes down then, you see. They decide and it goes clear down. And in science or medical or something, you never know who's going to think of the best thing. So Tuesday night, the white badge people had a meeting. You probably know about that. Tuesday night in the theater, they had no building where they would... Uh, all this was 10-year construction, and in that building they had a theater, of course, but on Tuesday night they had the MPs around, and you had to have a white badge. Now, my brother didn't quite have a degree or, or nobles, but they just gave them white badges anyway, but they didn't me, of course. And they would go just among all, for me and all of them, and sit there and listen to the talking on Tuesday night. 
and they would discuss and guys uh, had men and would get up and give talks and so forth because they never knew who would get the next best idea. See, that's completely different from the military organizations. And I think the military people, Groves, it was hard for them to understand that. But Oppenheimer told them it has to be that way. Now, one of the main guys that you hardly hear about was old Seth Nedemeyer. He was a nice fellow. And he thought of implosion, you see. And that's where we're out there. A lot of them didn't think that would work because you know, that gun gadget was the first, Hiroshima. They were sure about that, but they, they were, didn't think maybe that such implosion would work. So we did a lot of testing out there, what we called K-site. Hearst was a good man there. And uh, finally, they ordered this big steel casting, you know about that, but they didn't use it. Was that Jumbo? I, I no, they had a big steel casting that came out on the railroad and put it down at Kennedy site because if the explosives went off and the material didn't go, then they would have the material all over the countryside. So in the steel casting, the casting would keep the active material in there. And some, my brother said they thought, he thought they had him designed to go in and get the material out if it didn't, didn't blow up. But at the last, they were so confident on the testing that it would work, so they didn't use that steel casting. I heard it was left there. And uh, so they just went ahead and put it up in the tower, and uh, the thing did work. Beautiful sight, you understand, unless you're too close. So when you arrived at Los Alamos, how, how did you find out what your assignment was going to be? What, what group well, in the chemistry, to? where I worked first, this is what my brother and the others told me. It seemed like a fellow wall or something was in there. I suppose it was. He was chemistry. Mm -hmm. You've heard of him. Yeah. He seemed like the chemistry guy were good guys, and I would do just all kind of work around and make little trays or boxes for them and clean up the, uh, uh, where they'd take little uh, samples and so forth, and then I'd wash the dishes. Now, they wanted, and they had a, a vat where there was a lot of, uh, chemistry, I mean, it would burn through you. And they had a place where if you did get, they had aprons, and if you did get the acids on you, you'd run and jump on that platform. You didn't have to turn on the faucet because when you hit the platform, the spray, the shower would come all over you, you see. And the plumbers, of course, they fixed all that. So when you were working with chem in the chemistry group, were you working up with plutonium? No, I, I don't know. That was way above my head. Um, were there any safety accidents while you were there? No, I didn't see, uh, see any. There were two fellows who were killed. You know about that. I didn't know them. My brother may have knew them. So how long did you work in the chemistry group for? Oh, probably a couple of months. Did you know Joseph Kennedy? Oh, I'd say around, kind of a tall, thin guy. That's all I remember. Um, what was your brother working on in the chemistry group? Oh, this was all over my head, so to speak. They, they didn't. Uh, I helped him one time after I switched over and got over to Oppie's group. And uh, you see, the. the these explosions and primer guard, all that was so fast that an ordinary camera lens couldn't take it. And so uh, I helped Stribe, a fellow in, uh, in Seth's group, use primer card and uh, some chemicals we put together to blow up that would, after the shutter opened and the explosion went or something, then the smoke from the explosion would shut the uh, lens of the camera because the mechanical lens wasn't fast enough. 
Macmillan uh, figured out a rotating prism or something, I think, that was better than our, <laughs> our deal for camera closings. So after the chemistry group, where did you go? Well, I went over to Sess deal, but then I got so I didn't have enough to do or anything because down at my level, so I just quit and left, and then they put me back, and they drafted me when I quit, so then they, they put me back at Los Alamos. So that was when you got drafted into the Special Engineer Detachment? Yes, that was where they put the, uh, when he was in the military, yes. Yes, they had got that. Uh, there was a fellow, I can't think of his name. You see, when you see pictures of a lot of officers at Los Alamos, that may be as the MPs or the engineers. There was two uh, Navy guys that were um, officers in the tech area. Parsons was one, and I forget that guy. I used to see him around one time. He was a lieutenant commander, I think. Parsons was a captain. He did the pouring out there at HE. And the other guy, then after the war, he became director for a long time. I've forgotten his name, but he was Navy. Norris Bradbury? Yeah, that was him. I used to see him around and talk to him. But my brother something uh, told him that I was away, had been there, but was away in the military. And Bradbury got a hold of my person and had me put back at Los Alamos, he says. And the idea, anybody that's been here has got to stay. So they just put me back at Los Alamos and went back into Seth Nedemeyer's group. And he put me back on the hill on that uh, testing where they blow up the explosives. I'd set them up and then the guys would do the figuring. But we'd have raw um, little metals or uranium, different sizes, just the raw metal, real heavy and nickel colored some this big and some small of a golf ball size. And I'd put them in the sitter, and put the explosives around them and so forth so they could take pictures when they blew it up. Can you talk a little bit about what Seth Nettermeyer's group was trying to do with implosion? Well, you see, uh, some of the guys didn't think Seth's idea would work. And of course, you've got to get to all this explosives and primer card and electronics to go instantly together, you see. The gun gadget was in a sort of a tube, and they would push two uh, pieces of uranium together, 235. They'd push them together, and it worked, of course. But this implosion had explosives in a circle all around the centerpiece, the core. And you'd have 12, we had 12 pieces of explosives that they'd pour, and, and you had two pieces around that core metal. I'd keep it in my pocket or something, and then I'd put it in there when I was putting it together. But uh, then I'd get it all set up, and then they, all the guys that were really fizzed would come, and then they'd start checking the hookups and everything. And, um, lead into the control room. And I'd get back up out of the way, way back up, and they'd blow the whistles and it'd blow up and I'd see the uranium metal flashing up through the trees and everything. Then I'd go back down and get the parts and start another experiment when they got ready, of course. Um, so was that with uranium or was it plutonium for the implosion or was it with- It was metal? just the raw metal, I think. Just, just the the raw metal. And they had a bunch of batteries in the container, and the gas blew the lid off of it one time because they wanted a lot of electricity at some time to set set all those caps off for the primer cord. You see. And so you were trying to get the explosives to go at a just the same time? Oh yes, happen? all those cell pieces had to go at the same time or you'd have a side blowout of something, you see. To compress the center, you, you, you had to have all those pieces precise 
And I guess at first they were really worried that they could get and mold those pieces and have the high explosives uh, so uniform that they did that. Now, for instance, they had a frozen deal down the canyon and they wanted to dig a, a, a hole or something for a basement or other. So they put, the, we had composition B and pentalite as the high explosives. One was an English explosive. So we, um, the people dug this hole and put this high pressure explosives in there and it blew out fast. And so it didn't dig a good hole that they wanted, so they put the old dynamite down in the hole, and the dynamite pushed the ground up like they wanted. So in, in the explosives, you see, I'm this example, you have to have the proper materials, and the explosives act a little differently and so forth, so you have to have the explosives do the process that you're looking for, what you want done and they finally got the confidence in taking pictures and pictures of this explosive and the compression and everything, they finally decided it would work. And of course, in, down at Trinity, they, um, it did work. Um, can you talk about the Trinity test and the buildup and, and how you witnessed it? Well, I have a paper for that. And you see, on this deal, down south of Trinity, about 35 miles, it was a little town or settlement. And it was in the Wall Street Journal, and I have copies of that, of these people saying a lot of people died from the radiation particles that went down there, and they got cancer. Well, up on the hill, I looked at the explosion, you see. They had I turned my head around, and my eyes opened for that initial flash. And when the flash was over, I turned around. There was just four or oh, about a half a dozen of us there because um, Groves had decided that maybe the particles would come over there on some people way away. And we, we had two trucks, army trucks, six bys, and a Jeep, and we just have to go somehow get them and move them out of there if radiation's over. But the radiation didn't come. There wasn't any wind. And they had a Geiger counter, I think, there in the Jeep. And we had a, a radio to listen to the countdown to zero, you see. And um, that was what we were doing. And there was no wind. The uh, tremendous heat pushed all the dust particles and air virtually straight up and they had three mushroom clouds. One maybe was at 20 some odd thousand or uh, 15 and then 25 and then about the top one I think was a little above uh, or 40,000, maybe 45,000. The biggest mushroom topped out you see as the heat dissipated. But it took dust and sucked all the dust in around there up in the air and it went straight up so there was no wind to blow it around, to blow the particles down south 35 miles. So I just hated to somebody to be lying and, and, and doing it to the government. Now Ralph said, the rancher up north said that there was some radiation that showed up on his cattle by changing the hair color and they gave him a little money. But Ralph says, if anything, the wind was blowing from the south to the north these people that wanted money, of course, and the pictures in the paper were to the south, 35 miles. So Ralph, I called him about it, and he says, no, there was no wind. And I says, of course not. So I wrote and give that in a paper that I can give to you, and I wrote that paper letter to the Wall Street Journal. They won't publish it. I repeated this a month or two later to another. The Wall Street Journal sent me a letter about uh, their process and et cetera. So I sent it to that address. They have never published it. So it seems to me there is some people in this country, in power of course, that don't want to talk about the atomic bombs. So your role at the Trinity site was to see if 
any was to see if any radiation came in the way about 18 the, miles away. Yes, they had. And in Ralph's paper, it may give you details about the different uh, testing that they did. They put balloons, I think, up in the air down there. Ralph was about five and a half miles away in a trench, and it blew up, and then they got out of there. But they did some ground testing, air testing, and all around. <laughs> First, you've got to see it's such a tremendous big kind of nearly white, and then a red fireball that went up, of course, and expanded, and a um, very beautiful thing. Tremendous, a tremendous thing. There'd never been anything like it on Earth. So, of course, I was really amazed. But you see, uh, a fellow from our group that got me into this uh, group that went down about radiation, Conklin, I think, was his name, and he had a white badge, and he hollered at me, come on, we can go down. They didn't want people down there that the media and people might know that something was going on. And so my brother in chemistry group couldn't go down. Um, I was just fortunate because we were an experimental group. Now, Ralph was in John Manley's group, and of course they were in it, and Ralph spent two or three months down there getting the site set up and everything, you see. Um, The fellow that was later director uh, was in Ralph's group, and I think he went on the Hiroshima plane with the bomb. I have his name someplace written down in there. He was a director for a time after. Harold Agnew? Yeah. That's right. He was on the Hiroshima. Uh, yeah, I used to see him around with Ralph, and his wife liked to mountain climb with us. We mountain climbed some over Castro to the Crystals. And one time when we first got over there, it was about seven, 8,000 feet. There was a Los Alamos man and a woman and another man. But right away we recognized Teller. And Teller had kind of a bad foot, and he was over there walk, you know, climbing around. I was amazed at the, the, the Teller, and we talked to him you know, a bit. That's right, and he lost part of his foot in a streetcar accident. In, in Hungary, wasn't it? Mm -hmm. Yes. But he was, what was he like to talk to? Well, he's very, very decent, very congenial fellow. Yes. He and Oppie got crosswise, as you know all about that later on. What was Seth Niedermeyer like as a group leader? Niedermeyer? Yeah. Oh, he was very good, very friendly and congenial with me. And, um, uh, Some, see, in the military, sometimes, and you have this bad in the military in a lot of places in government, you give a person a little power, and they don't know how to handle it. Uh, and this is bad. You don't know they had a name for it in the military. Did you ever hear of brown nosing? That was so bad, you see. But there was very little of that in Los Alamos. My immediate boss was named Mueller, and I didn't brown nose Mueller, and he didn't care much for me. But I knew what I would have been, you do the work, and they look to see if you do the work. You don't give them a big song and dance. But he'd never been out among people, I guess, and he wanted that. So you, you have that all over. Um, people to get ahead, they play kind of a political game. But most of the guys at Los Alamos, you didn't have that. Um, there were some, of course, but um, Seth was, was, was very good and he gave me, you see, the SEDs, the civilians gave you the ratings in the military. Civilians promoted you. So he gave me the rating T something or other, I don't know what it's called, and that Oppie letter it says something about it. But Seth wrote it and then got Oppenheimer to sign it. And some play, well, Oppenheimer, no, they don't understand the integrity with these people was very, very, you might say, important or strict. Because who knows when 
you're talking to someone that knows more than you do. So I didn't, <laughs> they all knew more than I did. So you, you, you had that type of relationship there and different from the military. So Seth was, was very, a very decent fellow. And uh, he asked me uh, there after the war to get rid of everything. Some had left and everything, but I had low points in the military, so they kept me over for a while, till June of 46, really. And, oh, I guess in September, uh, Seth asked me to get rid of everything. Well, I took a few little pieces and put them in my pocket, and that I got rid of them because I put them in my pocket as souvenirs. So I got rid of the rest. Well, I blew it all up. That's what I did. But K-Site was down, but I went and got everything and drew it over at Cossie's site. They still had the wiring for explosives and everything. I got a six by and hauled it all over and blew it up. But I kept a few pieces in my pocket and took home. And in 48, there was in the paper about the guy at Los Alamos that had souvenirs. And they, then they had the Cold War started, so it was big in the papers. So I asked my brother, what am I going to do with these souvenirs now? This is, you know, this, what should I do? Well, we'll throw them away. So in behind the house, my grandmother's house is an old well, and I threw some, and he took, he was going to Colorado, and he threw some in a lake. And these were heavy and round, so they went down, and I threw them in this old well. So a fella showed up and came in. Well, he wanted to come in and talk, so I happened to be there, and he came in the house and talked a little bit. He was uh, from the government and so forth and wanted to know something about things, and he was easy. Uh, souvenirs and I wouldn't say anything. So he asked me to go out in the car and he got all of his papers again, the FBI, and showed me and went again if I had souvenirs. So I finally told him yes and I told him that I'd got rid of them since he was a scare on this thing and I'd seen it in the paper and, and decided and that I threw him in a well. He says, well, could I see the well? I said, sure. So I took him around behind the house and showed him the well where I'd thrown him. And uh, I don't know, there was a fellow going to Cape, that uh, fellow from Dexter, uh, and he may have told the round about that I had souvenirs. But I never told that stuff to anybody except that was there. No outsiders never talked. And Atkins may have done that. I don't know why they would have come to me. Of course, they told everybody in the papers, nobody knew anything about it. See, that was propaganda. So uh, I showed him the whole, so he asked me if I'd go with him up to the courthouse and he'd get a typewriter and type up my statement. So we went up the courthouse and got out where there was nobody around, you know, and he mooched the typewriter and typed it up and had me sign it on a page uh, that I had, and we had got rid of the instrument. But he was careful, I noticed, not to ask me details about the project of the bomb. Just this general souvenir thing was all we put down. Of course, even then they didn't want to say about the situation, you know, the bomb. What so. were the souvenirs? Were they explosives or? The souvenirs? They were little round pieces of metal, a little bit bigger than the golf ball. And we used them sometimes in the core on the explosions, you see. They used different pieces in there. Some were bigger as a softball, and these were about the size that I had, uh, a little bigger than the golf ball. So they were exper experimenting, you see, but I think they were some kind of heavy, real heavy metal. But not radioactive. I don't think so, but I'd see them flying through the air when they exposed them. I'd get back up behind trees, you see. So I... Uh, I think the bigger ones were the, just the kind of raw metal before it had been refined. 
That was my guess, but nobody ever said they. So where did the explosives experiments take place in the tech area? Well, we were up on the hill, you see. They, they had this whole place surrounded back on the roads, the MPs. And back on the hill there, Parsons had his uh, uh, pouring shacks where he would pour the different pieces of explosives, you see, different shapes. If there's another site, Kossi's site, I think, did explosive work. And I'd go over there with a pickup truck. There's a picture in there, old GMC pickup, and um, gather them up and, um, <laughs> and take them and set them up. But uh, that had to be uh, two or three miles or something like that back in the hills, you see. It went on up about uh, over those hills were maybe around back up in there around 10, 12, 11,000 feet. And um, so we were up maybe, Los Alamos is about 7,000 feet on the Mesa, and we were up maybe uh, 7,500 feet or something like that in the hills back where we could uh, do that explosive work. Had you ever worked with explosives before? No, nothing except the shotgun. Were you nervous when you first started working with explosives? No. <laughs> I figured they'd know what, knew what they were doing. And they figured out, and, and my brother had told me, of course, and maybe Ralph, and when we went down, Costia and I went down to the K site, we went down the day before and, and kind of slept in the back of the truck and got up in the night and went up on this hill, you see, and they drove the Jeep up there with the radio and everything. And uh, he gave, told me again, I'd heard it, but he told me again, and they had figured it out very closely what was going to happen. And then that shows you how smart we had some people that they had figured this out very well, how the explosives, uh, what would uh, happen, you see, and the fireball, the initial light, and the fireball, and everything. So I, I was quite impressed that uh, they seemed to knew pretty well what they were doing. Were people nervous before the Trinity test? Were they afraid it might not work? Well, there was some talk of that. Of course, but uh, they were really, I've heard skeptical of Seth's idea back, you know, the year before or so, but they began to believe probably it would work. Uh, of course, they didn't use that casting, steel casting, but I guess there were some, quite a few that was anxious about it. Of course, at my level, I just took it as things as they came. Well, yes, oh, oh, yes, I'd say out there at the K site, we didn't have much to do then because what we had done had worked, you might say. <coughs> and we'd sit and talk where they would drop the thing. <laughs> I remember I thought maybe if they dropped it in Tokyo Bay, it wouldn't kill so many people. It would still give them a good demonstration of how powerful it was, you see. So there was discussion about just where they should drop it and et cetera. Yes, there was some of that around. How did you find out about the bombing of Hiroshima? Well, uh, the guys, I guess they just talked about it. The news came right back that it worked and everything. I never did see that part, you know. The, the <clears throat> that was a different groups and so on. Well, some apprehension of how bad this thing was going to be in the future. Uh, I've heard some of the guys up, smart guys were really concerned about it. And, um, but on the whole with the war, uh, most opinions were that it was proper 
and being successful to end the war and save a lot of particularly American lives and probably uh, Japanese lives. Now, there at uh, Las Vegas, they have a conference room, and I went there two or three times, and uh, there was a woman there and there was one or two Japanese people, immigrants or something, but there was maybe a hundred people in the discussions. And she got up and she said, if it hadn't been for the bomb, I wouldn't be here. My father was a prisoner of war and he's working in a coal mine in Japan and they about had him starved to death. He would have died. The bomb ended the war and it saved his life and that's how I'm here. Well, I'll tell you after that, there was no expression negative about the bomb. So I talked to her some later that I, I think I was the only one there in the bunch that really worked on. Now a lot of them worked on the testing and had relatives at Los Alamos and later on and so forth. But um, I think I was the only one there that really worked on the bombs. Now you are familiar at uh, the reunion in 93 and Teller came and he wanted and Ralph says Teller wants to give a talk and he did and there was maybe 50 of us or so who went over to hear Teller talk or more and Teller said in just one sentence it hasn't been necessary that they, we develop the thermonuclears that hasn't been in print now, has it? You haven't heard of that? I'm not sure, yeah. No, they won't put it in print because of the political situation and the people there didn't want. I looked around for expressions on anybody's face because he was the guy that pushed it, you know, and against Oppenheimer and everything, and he pushed for it. And here's at least the guy who was, was honest there, I think, because he saw in the warfare, you don't want to tear up the whole city. You want to tear up the military objectives. And he didn't go into detail at all. He says it wasn't necessary to have built the bigger ones. And I thought, man, he sure has changed. But at least he saw the military applications and so forth. That's my estimate of it. But of course, the people had worked and worked for years and all that test site and all of that that uh, kind of, I'm sure, made them feel about, well, what were we doing? Here is Teller's turned around on us. And they have never, far as I could find, put that in print. But he said it in just one sentence. And Grotto will say that he didn't, I'm sure. Yeah. That's the political situation. That's very interesting. But, Did you ever work with George Kispiakowski? No, no, he was a chemist, you know, he, you know where he was a Princeton then back and No, I, I didn't. Uh, a fellow wrote a book, Ralph gave it to me, and uh, he was, it talks about some of the fellows early on back east at Harvard and around Princeton, their ideas, and he was uh, in the book quite a bit about uh, talking and working back east early on, you see, on atomic uh, power and so forth. But uh, Ralph said, Kissy Kelsey had mentioned that um, Seth had thought of implosion. Oh, yes. You did? Oh, yes. <laughs> Hanford and Oak Ridge, yes. What did you know about them? Well, I knew that they were refining, but I didn't know the difference 235 and 38, you know, the two places. But in the military, to keep anybody from catching on, they just sent... Um, instructions 
for me to go to Oak Ridge. And then at Oak Ridge, they had it. And I stayed there two or three days to go to Los Alamos. I knew where I was going, but I didn't tell anybody. But one officer says, well, I think you know what's happened, where you're going happening. I didn't say a word, because I did, of course, and he figured that I knew, because it had come through, you see. My brother had talked to this uh, Navy guy, well, I forget his name. He did the directing to put me back out there. They didn't want you to go around at all, hardly. And they put the thing around. If you get messed up or something, they got an island in the South Pacific where you can go. How did you find out that you were working on an atomic bomb? I don't remember, but you see, I suppose Ralph or my brother had had told me, I guess, at some time, and, and at what time I don't really remember. Did the other people in the SED know what they were working on? Well, the White Badge people did, oh yes. Now, Conklin was in the group, he was SED, and, and he knew, and uh, you know, the White Badge guys see that that was open for that class of intellect, so to speak, that have a degree, or close to a degree. And, and they could just go and sit down with the Teller and everybody, you know, or whoever was there, they could go sit down. Now, um, Beta, at one point, my brother was telling me, got after Teller. And Teller was working on the hydrogen, the thermals, you see. <laughs> and Beta told him, stop doing that. We've got to finish this bomb now that we're working on. Stop your, and get on to the, what we're doing and let that go. So, so Beta got after him <laughs> to get back on the project right now. Did you become friendly with other members in the SED? Well, yes, they had a machinist that was out there and then the fellow that uh, helped with the pictures, you see, in developing the pictures about the compression and everything, and he developed them, then he turned them over, to, went on up to Seth and so forth. We had a little incident that's beside the point, but maybe it will interest you about, and it goes on. So many of these books, uh, to me, are rather, it goes to so much about Groves and said they couldn't have had the bomb without Groves and on. No, that's nonsense. They had generals lined up by the hundreds, you see. Now, he was a good man, I don't wish that, but, but they had a lot of generals. Now, how many Fermis or Oppenheimers or Betas or Tellers or Seths did you have, you see? A few dozen, and so to speak, or a hundred or something. But, um, I'll just make a caustic comment about the fire department to give you a little idea of the real world. When my brother went there and Ralph in the spring, the old school had some horses for the students and kind of down the hill back, they had an old barn and Ralph and Keaton get down there and they could ride the horses maybe on Sunday. And we took the horses away, but this old barn was about to fall down. It was all wood, it wasn't very big. Well, it caught on fire, and I guess in maybe 44, say, in the spring. All right, they had a, a major or a captain or something in the fire department, the big fire department was close to the tech area. So he had to go put the fire out, and they didn't have much water, just some of the trucks. There was no fire hydrants. But he took the water truck, the fire hydrants and stuff, down to put out the, the, the old barn fire. And some of the people that had some smarts were exasperated. They were furious virtually. What if the tech area had got on fire? No fire. But it was the uh, engineering department that ran the fire department, PX and so forth. They got rid of that officer running the fire department and they got a retired fire chief from I believe it was Philadelphia, to come and run the fire department. They kept it quiet, though, but a guy 
in engineering told my brother what happened. There was a guy, the older fellow that was around there then with all of his fire caps and uniform on, civilian, and he was appointed. They brought him out to run that fire department because they figured it's too important. You've got to have a real fireman running this fire department. And he was over there at the fire department running it then. So why, that shows, shows you when they had something that they figured had to be done, they did it. They did it, and uh, they had two doctors, Hempelman and Nolan, there in the little clinic, and I went over a couple of times, civilian. Hempelman was a civilian doctor, and Nolan was a captain, and the military was a doctor. And if you got a little trouble or something like that, you'd go over to them. Well, it was just more like a little clinic. I went in one time and they worked on me a couple of times. Or in the military, they wouldn't do that, but they, 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 they had nobody could come in and tell them what to do, you see. And they had, I guess, around eight or 10 beds in the room. They had a little examination, x-ray rooms and stuff like that, and then they could bed maybe eight or 10 people, I don't remember. I knew a gal that worked there for him. Doris, I think was her name. I don't remember if Doris, she was an SED, I think. See, they had, or not SEDs, the wax. Keaton had a wax uh, working for him in the chemistry building back there. They had glass boards, machinists, and chemistry labs, and a, a building for supplies and, and so forth, all in the tech area. Glass blower and, and all kind of things. If somebody needed something, they had it supposedly right there. Well, the fellow that uh, ran the uh, kind of chemistry lab where they had all the chemicals and everything, and electronic, they had all kind of electronic equipment and so forth. He got lost in the mountain, a mountain trip one time and <laughs> got, he got found him. Was there much interaction between the SED and civilians on base? Oh, they had two missiles, uh, and the MP. The engineers ran the mess holes, of course. And uh, when I was a civilian, it cost me, I think, $30 a month. I made $85 a month, and I had a room. And I'd just walk over to this mess hall and, and eat, you see. And I had a ticket that I'd paid up. and the, the military could just walk in and <laughs> they didn't have to pay. When I was SEDs and the wax were down there and the civilians would go in there and SEDs and wax and uh, I remember there was a woman, uh, I guess she was a whack or something. She was a lieutenant and I talked to her a lot around and stuff and she was small and she says, well, when I was in, uh, working in the mess hall, I couldn't hardly pick up those big pans and wash them and put them in the rack. And I remember her telling me that. So uh, this is just, they had all kind of people that went over to the, uh, the mess hall. Some paid and of course the military didn't. And sometimes it wasn't worth paying for either, I'll tell you. Food wasn't very good? Sometimes, I remember Christmas in 44, they just threw the turkey out. It was blue, purple and stuff. It wasn't, people just threw it away. Um, since you had a car, were you able, you were able to travel around to Santa Fe and Albuquerque a bit? Yes, we went down there. Dick went down there to, you know, Keaton and Ralph and I would, would drive around and look around the, the area. Did you do any shopping or was it mostly just going outdoors stuff? Well, we'd go climbing the San Diego Crystals. One time they got uh, about 30 people, they got a big uh, six by, and we all, a whole bunch of us climbed into that and went over there and climbed on the mountain. I got up to over 13,000 feet before anybody else was close. I had an enlarged heart, a big heart, you see, and everybody's got to got muscles, but in climbing, you got to have a heart in the, and a windbag uh, to breathe besides muscles. So if you can't stand the altitude 
but I had a big heart and I could just go a thousand feet an hour up the side of the mountain and it didn't bother me at all. But after I got older, I couldn't do that. Did you ever go skiing at Los Alamos? No, no. We went back in the hills and get a, a six by and we drove up, a bunch of us would go. And a lot of the scientists and so forth would go, civilians. And we drive around some, um, there was a gunsmith over and oh, George Mellencrot, after I sold my car, he had a 40 Mercury. And so we'd ride around with George and his Mercury and that's where that picture was taken in the snow. We go over to a gunsmith, Lake Ackley was his name, that they liked hunting guns and so forth. So we just something to do, we'd ride around and, we know Ralph Noble took the picture and we was up high there and we was in George's car and so we'd ride around some that way. Um, now, so, um, you had mentioned that uh, you had left Los Alamos at one point because you didn't have anything to do in Sefsker. With Doctor? Or? You said that you had left Los Alamos uh, because you didn't have anything to do. Well, I just was so bored with it, so to speak, and I probably shouldn't have, you see, but I just did, and uh, it's a good, I guess after hindsight's so good that uh, they <laughs> put me back out there. Did they know that you were leaving? No, early on the personnel director, I think it's the name of Hughes out of St. Louis. No, I talked to him once in a while, but uh, no outside of Ralph or my brother is about all I, I told. Once you were in the SED, did you have to wear a military uniform? Just, yes, we had the uniforms and everything, but uh, in the military back then you had a, a work kind of uniform. And we just wore that. We didn't use the dress uniform hardly ever, except you went off of the base down to Santa Fe or someplace. They had kind of a bus you could go back and forth all the time. But um, the SED stayed pretty well there. And I did too as an SED. Uh, but we just wore the work uniform most all the time. And they had a little uh, office, and uh, the guys in the military office they weren't uh, they weren't tech people, you see, and um, you could get a pass once in a while or so forth there. But um, most of them stayed pretty close. Can you talk a little bit about George Mallinckrodt and his company's role in the project? Well, George, I think, was married then, and my brother got to know him. And then we flew around, George had the car, and I had sold mine. It was something to do. But um, then after the war, uh, my brother went and got his PhD in, in physics at, at St. Louis at Washington U. Well, George's dad, Ed, had give a lot of money to Washington U, and I think he gave uh, to Harvard. Maybe, you, you maybe know about that. I heard he gave a chemical building to him way back. But uh, my brother would fool around with George. George had a big house, of course, and he had a room for Keaton to stay, you know, visit with him and so forth. And then Ed had the house over. But George had planes. He had one on the West Coast that were special planes, and he had one at St. Louis, and then he had another on the East Coast, just in case he got back there and needed a, a plane. So um, then they had a farmhouse out there someplace. They'd go out there. And um, George went down to see my brother when he's teaching at Tucson at the university. He had a course in particular in nuclear engineering and the government would send, they had started this thing for submarines and so forth. And, you know, Robert uh, Nobles went out to Idaho and worked there after the war. So uh, George had some lady with him and uh, he had lots of them. 
And he went and got this plane, this little airport up close to where my brother lived. And my brother said, I knew George had not get back to the special plane that take off easy, but he says he didn't come back far enough to the runway and took off and went over and hit the John Deere building. So my brother was said he ran down there and threw George out through the windshield onto the building, but the woman in there had been pushed up against the dash, you see. Well, my brother got up there and got her back, and it, the plane was burning then, and she was burning, getting burnt bad, and he got burned a little bit, but he got it back and got her out a ways, and then that plane blew up. So he was after that, George gave him money and everything he wanted and everything, and uh, so with that kind of money, uh, they never know who is a friend of theirs or a friend of the money, but they never tell it. They're always friendly to everybody, but they don't tell it. But then Keaton was a family member because he could tell, and they'd, you know, he would go in on it and everything, and so Ed would have Keaton to go around with him. He liked schools and stuff. And he asked Keaton if he would tell George that if you bring the family name to shame, I'll disown him. You, if you, you tell George that, but I don't think Keaton ever got up the nerve to tell George. So he was virtually kind of considered there since he had risked his life to help him. He wasn't, he was a real friend, you see. Oh yeah, he's in the picture in his car. He had a four-door Forty Mercury we ride around in. Yes, that's where we got to know him. What, and, did, what was he doing at Los Alamos? Was he also in the SED? No, no, he was married. He was older. See, uh, if you were of a low age, you at Los Alamos, a civilian, they put you in the military. Keaton and Ralph were above that age, so they didn't put them in. Now, uh, and so was George was older then. I think he had an apartment. I think his wife was there. Um, Bill Nobles, that's, he's still, I think, in Albuquerque. Now, he was younger, and his dad got a job there, and he got an apartment, and his dad and his mother had the apartment, and Bill was there as a civilian. He had to go into the, the military, and he got his uniform and everything. He went right back into his bed and ate his mother cooking for the rest of the war. In the uniform, of course, because he was in the military. I never heard of that one before. Well, to the degree, it's what they don't want to talk about. And because that backside, you could walk in and out. Uh, uh, that They had a fence there, but that was kind of guarded up behind the hill. But uh, all those little ravines, the big fences out by the, the front, you know, the gates and the MPs, where we could just walk on the fence, uh, fence and, and, and hunt, do a little hunting and stuff on Sunday. And, um, but they had all that back road, uh, they had guards out there, of course, and they developed it more as time went on. But we could uh, check out trucks and cars and pickups and things. They had a motor pool and they worked on them down at the lower end there towards the gate. But they had, all kind of services, just one PX that I know of. The food was so bad, I got a job there later on in the evening to do cooking, and I got a friend there, SED, a job, because we got a lot better food than the mess hall, and they had an ice cream counter that closed in the evening, but we opened it up for us, you know. <laughs> and we take turns cooking and eating, but worked there for a while. And they paid a little bit of money, but a good part of it was just uh, being able to get the food and, and that you wanted. Did you know any of the men who were later discovered to be spies, like David Greenglass? No, I didn't. 
I didn't. Um, I don't know if Fuchs was in that mess hall where my brother was, maybe, but I don't know that he knew him. I, I don't know that he knew him. What kind of a work schedule did you have? Oh, we used to work five days a week. And some guys, they had interest in something, maybe go back Sunday and do, you know, do something in the pen. But uh, we'd start out, uh, uh, a lot of times we'd have a car pickup there at the SED place. Of course, we had to go out. A lot of them just walked up the tech area. And, but uh, we'd just drive out in the car. We had a 40 Ford and I uh, had a GMC pickup that I get supplies in. But Ogle, Bill Ogle, he stayed on at Los Alamos. A lot of them left, but he went down the South Pacific and, um, and worked on the thermals down there. But he'd drive a 41 four door Chevy black a lot of times, and we'd ride around because we had to ride out there a couple of miles. Well, I figured I had to get out and get busy and make a living. That's about all I know. I, that was the big concern at my age, and I was about maybe 22 years old then. So that was, uh, of course, I was glad to have the war over. And a friend of ours we grew up with, he became a doctor later, and he and I roomed up the Missouri the University together. and. Uh, he got into the uh, Marines, and they had people up at the university talking to you to sign up in their department, you see, and he signed up with the Marines. They told him he could stay in school longer. Yes, but when they got him, he got, <laughs> not to say in the United States, he sent him to the Pacific, a lieutenant or something, you know. And uh, on Iwo Jima, I believe it was, he was hit by a fragment in the leg, but he'd healed up. And he told my brother when he found out that it worked on the bomb, he says, well, I'm sure glad of it because you guys probably saved my life because we were scheduled to attack Japan. And uh, he says that probably saved my life. Do you think your work on the Manhattan Project affected your later career? No, I just worked mostly for myself, so I... I don't think it did. Well, what did you end up doing as your Well, parents? mostly farming. But I just got interested there where I grew up, and my mother was a school teacher. She had passed away, so I just built them a library and gave them a library. They furnished the ground anyway. Then I, uh, a friend there, a kid, he got, his post obviously, uh, he was killed in Vietnam. Kenny's sister, and he, he wore the, uh, the Congressional Medal, though. Uh, and they talked to me about building a little memorial on the library ground. I would go ahead. And I got thinking, and then I built that memorial there to all the guys at Dexter that were killed in war and started at the First World War and come on up to Vietnam. There was about 24 names on there. Three of them I knew, one real well that was killed in Germany outside. He shot down in his plane and the Volkstrom caught him out 23 miles from Munich and killed him. So I put up that memorial the names of guys that were killed. How often, was the war constantly on people's minds at Los Alamos? I think there was a general feeling we have to do it. We surely, you know, get it done for the war. There was a little talk, but I, some of the guys, you know, Mr., uh, you know who Mr. Baker was? Uh, oh, uh, Niels Bohr. Yeah. <laughs> so, they, uh, they, 
I think most of them kind of thought we were ahead of Germany. And as I think what I read is that Germany didn't do a lot of the work because they had so much to do militarily in Europe. And of course, I think they made a big mistake of thinking England would give up. And they spent a lot on bombing England. And I think that was a big mistake for them, those England bomb wars. The, the housing. Oh, it's what they call ten-year construction. Um, they had the old school of buildings for the top guys. There were a few of those for housing. And I remember Oppenheimer's wife, I had that nice little new Chevrolet, but she had a convertible, a 41 Cadillac convertible. <laughs> but uh, then they were building apartments some, I think, kind of two-story, and they'd have two or three apartments for building. And um, they had dormitories, so to speak, for guys. And um, I was in one of those as a civilian. And then they had dormitories, more or less, for the women. And then down where the SEDs across there was a mess hall. And then the wax were had uh, over f across the road. But um, they built houses after the war, you know, there. And they got in a hurry and they made a big mistake, what they don't talk about, I guess. They built flat roofs in New Mexico and they put green lumber up there. And when the green lumber died, it shrunk and it it sunk down, and then when it rained, it would have water, a pool of water on the roof, so they had to redo the roofs. Have you been back to Los Alamos since 46? I came through there a couple, three years ago. A fellow went out. I had a house out in Carefree, Arizona, and he went out with me from Dexter, and I went up and showed him the Grand Canyon, and then, um, came through the backside, what was it, Cuba, and that back road through Los Alamos. I had to ask a fire station how to get out of there. It was built up so. Now, I was there in 54 and to visit George Nobles. And uh, a friend, uh, a sister, the pilot, and his dad, they had an airplane, and, and we rode out in about 48 and uh, they hadn't been in Los Alamos. I went with them, the three of us, and Nobles drove us up. We landed there at Santa Fe, and, and they drove us up and looked around. And uh, then I visited there, the Nobles in 54, I think, and went on west. But, um, I kind of retired from farming in Arizona and California, built a house and sold it, and sold it to a fellow behind me who had a big house. He wanted another one, Phil, the neighbor Phil Wrigley, and I sold my house to Phil. He was in the chewing gum business, I think. Did the way the work was done at all negatively? The fact that you didn't no, know you were working? No, I don't. Some of the guys were a little disgusted. They'd never been kind of hemmed in. It was kind of more what you'd say a personal matter that they'd get a little bit uh, perturbed about it. But I don't think it was a necessary item. And I don't think that uh, it was too negative, so to speak. Uh, when we went up there, you know, we would cross that bridge of the, from Santa Fe at Pewaukee. And the bridge then came down and you went up to Espanola and came around the long way to get up there. When I first drove up there, they didn't much of a road. Those sandy washes, as you're familiar, it's a creek that doesn't run very much during the year, 
and they just bladed it out because it was sandy, you see, and bladed it out for a road going up there, and then they went in the switchbacks to get up there, and later they put the, the mesa up a long road. But when I first went up, it was just switchbacks up there, but they still had an MP gate. So looking back, how do you feel about working on the Manhattan Project? Well, it's quite interesting. I, I think it's quite interesting. I have some notes here that I made about ideas, and I, I don't know if I've skipped anything or you have in the uh, talk that might be of interest. If you would like to share anything else. No, I, uh, I just have some notes here, and I don't know if you have time. I wrote down names of different people and uh, of course, my brother had his picture in a paper out there one time at Fuller Lodge for reading there, and, but I had it and I lost the, the paper that they put out there. And uh, I've talked about the mail and uh, so. Well, it was very interesting, and I uh, it was really a great, great experience. I'll try to look up that letter that I sold uh, the Wall Street Journal. That'll give you some information on Ralph and our kind of experience and ideas about the Trinity site, and. Yeah, Ralph was down there at the Trinity site for nearly three months, and his brother Bill worked down there for a fellow that came out of Europe, a, a physicist. And uh, I, of course, always impressed by Fermi that came out when I was working out there. And you would have never guess that most guys that I heard about thought he was a top man. Just real easy going, no bluster, no puffed up or anything really. But you know, a guy on the top that way doesn't have to put on because <laughs> there he is, a little sister. Uh, I just am trying to think of anything. I saw uh, it. The few of us were there at the uh, Las Vegas Test Site Museum, and Eisenhower's granddaughter and I got to talking. She said, "He's Eisenhower's granddaughter, real tall woman." And I talked to her some about the bomb and the experience and so forth. Wow. But they still have people there. They had a group one time as there from Japan came, you know, and you can go through the museum. I have a friend that her husband was the uh, test site meteorologist, and when the wind was blowing the wrong way toward Vegas, they wouldn't shoot. He'd tell them you can't shoot because the wind's wrong. <laughs> he passed away with cancer, though, Phil, but his wife volunteers down there at the test site.